Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Hope you guys didn't miss us. Um, we definitely missed you. We're back. We're in Luke 21. We're going to continue where we left off last time. And we're in the last week. So we already had the triumphal entry. So Jesus is hanging out in Jerusalem and on the Mount of Olives doing teaching and stuff, telling parables and cleaning out the temple, doing all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's where we are. So before we begin, as usual, we're going to ask the Lord's blessing on today's meal that we're going to consume and, and, and take it in. So Lord, we just bow before you and thank you for your word. Thank you for this chapter, Lord. We definitely invite your Holy Spirit here to inhabit this place and to open our eyes and ears to hear and see what you have for us, Jesus. In your name, amen. amen. Let's start off with verses 1 through 4. Luke writes in chapter 21, starting at verse 1, And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a certain woman, a certain poor widow, putting in two mites. He said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. I wrote in my notes, God's economy versus our economy. Okay, and God's economy, or ours, is based on how much we have. Like, uh, you see these lists come out all the time. Who are the top ten world's richest men? The top ten world's richest women? The top ten richest whoever? Or most paid actors? Uh, most paid sports figures? We measure our money, or our economy is measured on quantity. How much do you have? As far as money goes, God's is measured just the opposite. How much are you left with? After you give. What are you left with? See, these guys were putting in their millions, but they had billions, is the issue. It really didn't hurt them that much. They could put in their 10% all day long, and it really wouldn't, wouldn't hurt them a lot. But this poor lady gave in to the two mites, which was considered the minimum offering that you could give to be acceptable. It was two mites. Together, those two mites equaled about an eighth of a penny. Okay, that, that's what it would equal in today's economy. So, but the Lord said, hey, she's more blessed than, than all these rich guys because she gave in everything. Whereas those big cats, they put in millions, but it really didn't cost them anything. My dad always said, man, you can only put on one pair of jeans at a time. Yeah. Why do you have 15 pair? I don't know. <laughs> so what you're left with, um, her gift was more valuable to God because she gave all others, gave millions. But to God, they were actually giving less. The next two verses, verses 5 and 6. Then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, These things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So if you know Jerusalem and how the Temple Mount was situated, how the Temple was built above, and if you went there and look at it today, you can see the Wailing Wall, where the Jews gather in front of like the, the only wall remaining of, of the old Temple foundation, straight up, you know, at the top, was it like 40 or 50 feet, is where the Temple was actually built on top of there. So when they say not one stone will be left upon another, those stones that made the Temple on top were thrown down. And they have, we, I brought the picture in a couple weeks ago when we talked about this back in um, chapter 19, 43 and 44. We talked about it where it says, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. That was his comment to them for not recognizing the day he went into Jerusalem on the donkey that he was the king. But those rocks are still there, and you could see them. They're still there today, and you could see the cracks in the pavement from when the Romans threw them down, and they landed on the pavement and cracked it uh, when this was actually fulfilled. Um, so Jesus told about it like some 40 years before, or 38 years before it happened, um, before their judgment came. And uh, this temple, it was said that there was a side of it um, well, they decorated it so ornately with like gold shields around it that when the sun hit it, it was blinding to look at the temple. It was just so, so fabulously ornately decorated. And the Lord said, 
you're looking at the wrong thing. You're focusing on the wrong thing, guys. Because this is going away. It's temporary. So, 7 through 11, and this is where we start to get deep. Luke 21, verse 7. So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, Take heed. Now pay attention to the order and the things he lists here. Take heed that you not be deceived. Number one, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he. So the first thing is deception. The time is drawn, is, has drawn near, therefore do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified by these things. Um, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not be immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilence, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Pretty encouraging, huh? <laughs> the Lord's saying, hey, you want to know when these things are going to happen? Now this, this talk he's having with them, I, we think is a separate one than, than the talk he gave to the disciples in Matthew. This one points more towards when Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem. The one in Matthew points more towards his second coming at the end of the tribulation. Okay, They're not mutually exclusive. There's a lot of common denominators in here. Uh, so both mentioned both times, but the, the distinction is this talk he's given is pointing more towards that time in 70 A.D., uh, about 38 years after he died, when Rome came in and leveled the place. First thing he warns about is deception. Have we heard that before? Yes. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5 says this, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. Can you believe it? People actually leaving Christ? Giving heed to deceiving spirits? And doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, what qualifies them? That's the generic, the general thing. Stay away from these. Watch out. Some people are leaving the faith to follow these other denominations, if you will, offshoots of Christianity, being led by deceiving spirits. Now, what specific things is he saying to watch out for in these denominations? First thing, forbidding to marry. Do we know of any denomination that <laughs> forbids marriage to their priests or anybody else? Yeah, they're, they're I'm, and I'm not, I, I, I can't call any names, but <laughs> <laughs> if you know who I'm talking about, you know who I'm talking about. Now, so, second qualifying thing, and commanding to abstain from foods. Are there any dietary restrictions in these other denominations? Maybe on Fridays or something? Um, were there? Is there? Can we? Can we? Not anymore. In, in, I came in Catholicism because I grew up Catholic. They're, they don't have it anymore. You don't have to abstain on a Friday. You can you say that a louder for the. <laughs> oh, you do not have to abstain on Friday anymore. anymore in from, from, okay, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. um, the Jewish people though, couldn't tell that, you. that was more wasn't. Their rules about pork and stuff because um, of the way back then they couldn't. Yes. What they couldn't preserve it or something. I don't know about that. Bad. They didn't. I don't know. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if Paul's referring to that specifically. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't know. It, he might have been alluding to that, but I think he's he's uh, there's others where people were slipping from the faith and getting caught up in, in more cultish activities, which were limiting to them. Um, kind of like you look at the, the cults of today, Jim Jones, David Koresh, um, the hale Bop Comet cult, all these different ones that uh, where, where these cult leaders um, forbid their people to be marrying because the cult leader wants all the women for himself. Right. And, and they do these things, and, and, and that's... I think that's more like what he's, he's looking at, where they start off as an offshoot of Christianity, but go way up on the deep end. He's saying, watch out for these, because they're de it's deception. But, you know, I, I just read recently an article. I have not seen it because I don't get HBO, but there's a new special on HBO with John Goodman, 
I believe the televangelist megachurch mm-hmm. is making a parody and, and satire uh, about, it's called the Gemstone Family, and it says how all these big, um, you know, mega evangelists are just out for money, and even how the ones who started out well, mm-hmm. their sons now have corrupted what they once had. Never seen that before. <laughs> it's new, it's something new, it's new. Okay, I but, never saw it. But anyway, the, the, there are certain things to watch out for. Things that are okay in Christianity, supported in Christianity, but these other groups twist and, and trying to get you uh, astray, forbidding to marry, commanding uh, to not to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Why do we pray over our food? Because it says to in the Bible right there. Receive it with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by what? By the word of God and prayer. So we pray over our food. If anybody asks why, just direct them right there. More deception. I know what you're thinking. Say it isn't so. Second Timothy 4. Turn a few pages. In 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 5, it says this. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires because they have itching ears that will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables but you be watchful in all things enduring affliction do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry paul says and that's to all of us as christians we're under that charge wherever whatever arena the lord has called you or put you in Fulfill your ministry. Do your part. Christianity is not a spectator sport. We're not supposed to be in the stands watching the players on the field do their thing. We're all in it. We're all in this thing. But whatever ministry you got where the Lord's put you, be encouraged. Fulfill it. But watch out for deception. Um, as Paul said here, there's many going to come um, with false doctrine. Second Peter, so Peter warned about it too. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. Uh, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways. Isn't that sad? Many will follow their destructive ways. Because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Can you think of any denominations that are kind of radical that cause like Christianity to be blasphemed among the people because they, they're like, oh, look at those fill-in-the-blank errs. Um, they're so wacky. They're so weird. You know, look what they do. Um, and it's because of deception. Uh, what's the bottom line of the enemy? What's his goal? Steal, kill, and destroy. He doesn't care how he does it. He doesn't care about the method. He could get you caught up in drugs, alcohol, sexual vice, whatever. He doesn't care how he gets you caught up. His one goal is to deceive you, to think that what you're doing is not really that bad. You and God have an understanding. He knows your weaknesses. Baloney. God has zero tolerance for sin. If you have any doubt of that, look at the cross. How much tolerance was there on the cross? None. Zero tolerance. So, but for sinners, endless grace. Verse 3 of that same passage, we'll finish up. Um, In 2 Peter, by covetousness, they will exploit you. By what? By covetousness, they will exploit you. Wow. Okay. Paul said it. And we can go starting from when he said it all the way down the line for the past 2,000 years and name names and ministries of people, pastors, so-called, whatever you want to call them, who are covetous. And they're exploiting people, sending widows, letters in the mail. Well, if you'll just contribute to this ministry, God will bless you ten times. You'll see. Wow. Wow. By covetousness, they are exploiting you with deceptive words. 
For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. So God knows. In other words, he's keeping perfect score for all of these ministries who've been exploiting people by covetousness. Last one. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. This is the one that's... I know we've con gone over this a thousand times. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. That was written about 2,000 years ago. How much more worse and deceptive and strong do you think that spirit of Antichrist is now? So the bottom line, the first thing that Jesus warns about is don't be deceived. Be careful. Watch watch what you're listening to. Watch what church you go to, what you're hearing on the TV, on the radio. Line it up with this word because if it doesn't fit in this parameter, you got to throw it out. Remember what they do to bank tellers. They stick them in the vault to feel money over and over and over and over and over again to get to know the real money so that when a counterfeit comes in, they can spot it. Get to know the real thing. This is your vault. Get to know it. It's got tons of good information. Know it inside and out. So that when the counterfeit comes, you can you can know, spot it. Did you hear a couple of those verses? They're talking about denying the Lord, denying Jesus. And the last one we read, test the spirits, because there's some who say Jesus Christ really didn't come in the flesh. So there are denominations out there who deny the deity of God the Son. You know, and, and I didn't have this in my notes, but that brings up a verse in Proverbs. Um, the next to the last chapter. Um, when the question is asked in verse 4 of chapter 30, who has ascended into heaven? Who is he talking about? Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? I'm talking about God, right? Okay. The question is, what is his name and what is his son's name? Does God have a son? You bet. It's called God the Son. <laughs> Not too heavy scientifically there. God's name. God's name is Jehovah. Yeah, and his, his son, son's name Jesus. Is Jesus. Exactly. Um, so there's some who deny that. How can you deny the word of God? I don't get it. I don't get it. However, some do. And the warning is, don't be deceived. Jesus is the only anointed one of God the Father, the only Messiah. Um, you can read about in Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2. The first seal. You know, Revelation 6 is about the, the first the seals that are opened up, right? So what's the first seal? Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a, la with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on, sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. We know who that is. The Antichrist. The final deceiver. Of all time, the world's greatest and best, most the sharpest looking, the most charismatic attitude, the guy you just want to hang out with is like, wow, that guy is just cool. I want to be around that guy. Just the most magnetic personality and deceiver. Bottom line, talks with a forked tongue so smooth you, many will be deceived because God himself will pour out a spirit of deception on the people at that time. So that's the final, the final one. Going back to Luke, what do we read about in verse 8? Take heed, there's going to be many deceivers, saying, I am he. Verse 9, but when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass. But that's not the end. Wars, huh? I made these notes a couple years ago. Um, but I think they're still pretty accurate. Currently, there are 41 conflicts in the world, 12 of which have an annual death rate of 1,000 or more each year. Okay? 
Since World War II, there has not been a single day of world peace since World War II. That's a long time. It's 1945. Yeah, they make you rich if you're in the, if you're an arms dealer. Of course, peace is not very good if you're an arms dealer. They kind of do bad on that. Um, so that's that's that. What was the second seal? Should have held my finger there. In Revelation six verses three and four, when he'd opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So the second seal, we just read about wars and rumors of wars. Incidentally, isn't this ironic how what the Lord is saying here parallels that chapter? But we're not done yet. When this seal is broken and peace is taken from the earth, that means, whereas as now you have people who will kill usually for something, you have something they want. You know, you'll see a, an employee who was fired go back and, and shoot people in the building who was fired from, going postal, we used to call it, because he has a, there was a job that he wanted. He had a reputation. He was shamed, embarrassed. So he's going to go back and shoot the place up. Um, this one in Revelation has no reason. This, when peace is taken from the earth, there's this killing for the sake of killing. No reason whatsoever. Just because. Not that you have something that I want. I just want to kill. Don't know why. Peace is taken from the earth. And it's wholesale killing anybody you want, anytime, for any reason. Or no reason. Um, verse 11, we talked about uh, there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilence. Earthquakes. Yep. I just want to talk about earthquakes in the world that are eight and a half on the Richter scale or greater. Okay, eight, there's a massive ones. We're not talking about sixes or sevens or even eights. Eight and a half or higher. There was one measured uh, pre-1400s, one measured in the 1400s, one in the 1500s, Four in the 1600s, five in the 1700s, five in the 1800s, 12 in the 1900s, and so far since the year 2000 there has been six. If we keep up this trend, we're on track to have a total of 50 or more before this century is out. Eight and a half or higher on the Richter scale earthquakes. What was next that he talked about? Earth, so we talked about earthquakes, uh, famines. Since 400 BC, there have been 134 catastrophic food shortages called famines. That's globally. Now, globally, we're, we have less food in storage now than in the 1920s. Globally. We are one drought away from, what do they call it, an existential experience here? Uh, I just learned that recently. Um, we're on the verge of extinction. It's an existential catastrophe. Something that can bring an end to humanity. We're one drought away from worldwide cata ca catastrophic food shortage. That's how close we are. Why is it that because it's on the rain? Scary. Yeah, that's what... Yeah, we're one drought away from a global catastrophe. Food catastrophe. Yeah, because that's the other thing. The last one is pestilence. Since 1500 B.C., and this, the records were started in Egypt, so they started keeping these records about pestilence in Egypt. 1500 B.C., that's a long time, right? Listen to this. There have been 222 catastrophic, catastrophic disease outbreaks, including cholera, Ebola, polio, bubonic, and other plagues, mumps, hepatitis B, etc. Est, estimated 3 million in the U.S. alone with AIDS right now. That's huge. Incidentally, 46 of those 222, which is like 25%, it's a large portion, maybe 20% of these disease outbreaks have been since the year 2000. That's huge. Since 1500 BC, when they started keeping records, 
it has been on the increase, all these, the earthquakes, the famines, and the pestilence, like birth pains increasing in frequency and in size and scope since they've been keeping records. And the ones that were eradicated mm -hmm. are now kind of yeah. yeah. And the bubonic plague and some rats on there. Superbugs, yeah. I'm like, yeah. isn't California where all the rats yeah, are? Yeah, in California there's a, a large bubonic plague outbreak because of like all the, the massive homeless situation yeah. out there. It's, it's pretty nasty. Yeah. So now, does this also parallel in Revelation? Yeah, going back to 6 again, verses 5 and 6, same chapter about the, the seals. It talks about when he'd opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarii, and three quarts of barley for a denarii. And do not harm the oil and wine. What's that all about? Third horse comes out. The third seal of the Lord's breaking in the tribulation. Worldwide catastrophic famine. Uh, the barley and the wheat measurement and the day's wages, the denarii, was one meal for one day's wages. Okay? That means you could not afford to feed your family. You, for one day's wages, you would work for one meal's worth of bread. And that's it. So, but apparently this drought does not go deep enough to affect these deep-rooted plants, like the olive tree and the grapes. So the wine and, and the olive oil are not affected. So, you know, people are saying invest in this, invest in that. I think I'd be investing in, like, what's going to be really scarce? Wheat and barley. If you're going to be, if you plan on being here, past the rapture, wheat and barley, man, you're going to make your money. <laughs> There's your stock tip for the day. Verses 7 and 8 of that same chapter, Revelation 6, verses 7 and 8. When you'd open the fourth seal, I heard the fourth, I heard, yeah, the fourth living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death and Hades followed after him. And power was given to them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and the beasts of the earth. Wow. A fourth of the earth. We're looking at approximately, what, about maybe two billion people? Just wiped out. Boom. That's huge. And the Lord is warning us of that, of course, if you're born again, I don't believe, and we'll get into that later, that we'll have to even worry about that. Back to Luke 21. Luke 21, we left off on verse 12, I believe, correct? So we're going to pick it up, verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all of your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. This message I just read, those verses. How much have you heard them taught on television? What did we just read? By these deceivers, by covetousness, they exploit you. See, they don't teach the whole counsel of the word of God. They teach enough to tickle itching ears to get you to buy in, to please contribute to the address at the bottom of your screen. And the Lord will bless you ten times, you'll see. But it depends on how big your seed faith is. Remember what Paul said, that the Lord blesses, you know, according to what you give. So the bigger your gift, the more blessing you'll get. I'm just saying what the Word says, right? <laughs> we accept cash, credit cards, checks, whatever you got. Gold bullion, just send it all. Um, you don't hear messages about persecution, but Jesus 
wanted to let you know what you're really in for if you're serving Jesus. If you're serving Him, this is what you can really expect. I, I didn't say this. Jesus Himself, God the Son, said this. This is His testimony to us, to warn us, to encourage us, to be ready, because He said, this is an opportunity for you to witness and testify of me. But it's true. I can't name names, but I've been in churches where I've been betrayed by the people there. And I'm talking, they were like hustling elders and benevolent ministries. That's sad. Yeah, it is sad. But how many times do you hear Peter, Paul, even Jesus himself warning that from among the church would rise up these People that we look to and respect and think, wow, you know, it could never be that person. Hi, what about some of these who think, uh, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm a good Christian and I, I do this, I do this, uh, like I'm supposed to, like the Bible says, and uh, oh no, that, that would never happen to me. Be deceived? Uh, persecuted. Oh, persecuted? Oh, Oh, no, no. The more close you are to the Lord, the more at risk you are of persecution. Yeah. We're going to read that verse. That's one of our many verses that they who yeah. choose to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Um, it's... That's what you have to look forward to. That's what I'm not. I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking of someone else. We are, if you have accepted Jesus, you're on the list for persecution. If it hasn't got down to you yet, praise God. If it has, you're guaranteed you'll know Jesus in a way you've never known him before. Because when he says, my grace is sufficient for you, you won't know it until you need it. I think about that tonight when it storms. But when, yeah, when you need it, he is there for you. Well, in Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, there's a story of one guy who I've told us a dozen times that we'll tell it a dozen and one, who the people said to him, we've got to know. We have to know if the Lord's grace is sufficient. Give us a sign while you're there in the flames if the Lord's grace is sufficient or if it's not. And the man said, I will raise my hands and clap them to show you if the Lord is sufficient or not. While he was burning and they thought he had died and they had just about given up, the ropes had burned off his hands and his flesh was starting to come off, they melt off his hands. They thought he was, he was gone. All of a sudden, his hands come up. And he claps his hands. And he claps his hand again. And he claps his hands again. Three times he clapped his hands to show how the Lord's sufficiency was enough for him. Burning in the flames. The Lord carried him through. Remember how Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego did that? And when they came out of the fire, it says, not even the smell of smoke was on them. You think the Lord would be any less there for us? No way. So I don't think we should fear persecution. The Lord didn't. He went to the cross boldly. He took it for us. I just uh, want to say one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh yeah, you bet. And then he was, he went to, he went to jail. Hmm. Uh, every denomination warned him when he went praising the Lord. Hmm. And I was a member of God, and he was going to jail. Uh, but the one that prayed for Wow. Yes. And she prayed for us. And the, the one that was over here was praying for us. Uh, and we all prayed. We had Bible study. Mm. Mm. In, in the section. Wow. Section. Yes. All, and all of us were set free. 
That's how the Lord works. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Good testimony. Um, there's a church in Revelations. If you, if you know your, your Revelations, chapters 2 and chapters 3 are the seven letters the Lord wrote to his church. Um, there was one church called the Persecuted Church. It's the Church of Smyrna. And Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Listen to how he warns them. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. See how the Lord warns the church? He tells the church, and I'm letting you know that you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be thrown into jail, some of you. But he just said here in Luke, count it, it's going to be counted as an opportunity to witness. So the 10 days might not be a specific 10 days. The Lord is, it, some people may think it's just a certain set amount of time that the Lord has planned. It might not be a literal 10 days, but it, it's going to have an end. It has a beginning and an end. It's not an eternal thing or forever. He just doesn't want them to get discouraged. In John, John chapter 15, verse 20, the Lord says, Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my word, they will keep yours also. Did they persecute Jesus? Just a little, right? Persecuted him to death. 2 Timothy 3, 12. We were all over today, Miss Linda. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3, 12. says this. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That doesn't necessarily mean everybody is going to be like uh, what we think of these martyrs, what they've gone through, burned at the stake, tortured horribly. Persecution can come in many ways. You know, the enemy can harass you in your spirit, in your soul. He can use people here at Metaview to give you a hard time, try and push your buttons and get you upset. Okay, persecution can come from any angle. <clears throat> the promise is that because you've declared war on Satan by accepting Jesus Christ into your heart and becoming born again, you will suffer persecution. Not one of those favorite verses you want to stick up on your refrigerator. <laughs> to go back to John. John, John chapter 16, it says this. <laughs> These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Why has he told us this? To warn us so we don't stumble. Because he doesn't want you thinking this is going to be a bed of roses, this walk of Christianity. He doesn't want you thinking you are entitled to health, wealth, and prosperity. He doesn't want you thinking that. He says, I'm telling you these things, Jesus is, so that you don't stumble. So be careful. They will put you out of synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he's offering God service. I'm doing God a favor by killing you. <laughs> wow. Not, not my God. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So he's warning them that people are going to come and kill Christians thinking they're doing God's service. They're doing it for God. But Jesus says they really don't know God. 
those who are killing in the name of God don't really know God. Is what Jesus is explaining here. They have it backwards. The God they're killing for is not Yahweh, Jehovah, Yahweh, the one in the throne in heaven, or his son, Yeshua, the Messiah. It's false gods. What God of love who would send his only son to die for you would then want you to kill people who believe in you? I don't get it. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense, does it? So, just a word of warning for those who think they're doing God's service by killing Christians, you're not. Persecution. Up until 1900, 14 million documented martyrs. 14 million. Between the time of Christ and about the year 1900. 14 million, okay? From 1900 to 2000, 26 million documented martyrs. In that one century nearly double the amount since the time of Christ up until 1900, just in one century. And has it gone down? No way. It is open season on Christians, even right now. What do you think Turkey's doing? Killing Christian Kurds. Shameful. That's just the documented martyrs. There's been more, I'm sure. So, does this also parallel... Revelation 6, I wouldn't be turning there if it didn't. Revelation 6, 9 through 11 says this, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of those of their fellow servants and their brethren who will be killed as they were was completed. So during the tribulation, there's still going to be a lot of martyrdom going on. But the Lord has all those martyrs in his hand. He's comforting them. And dressing them. And the Lord's not a second-rate tailor. When will, will it end? When will all this end? Well, for that, you've got to go to the back of the book. Revelation 21. Soak this in and just relax in these verses. Just soak them in like you're on the beach and it's soaking up the sun rays. And you can feel the warmth of the sun on you and just soaking it in. Or in a nice hot shower. Or to buy a nice warm fireplace when it's zero degrees outside. Whatever picture you want to use. Soak these in. Like a piece of toast with melted butter. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. From God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Amen? Amen. It will end. I want to go to Philippians 4, 11 through 13. These are very common verses, but I think they need a little qualification because we pull out Philippians 4 like a kid in the classroom who never studied for his test. Oh, but I can do all things to Christ who thanks me, right? I can do all things to the Christ who strengthens me, but I didn't study for this test, but I can, I can still pass it, right? Oh, you can't take a verse out of the Bible like that and use it however you want to. There's something called context. Because a text taken out of context is pretext used for another false reason. Not what it's intended to be used for. That verse has been so maligned. Philippians 4. Let's go back up a couple verses and get what it's for. Paul writes, Now, I, now that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be 
content. We lack contentment, especially in America. When we look around at, at the so-called Joneses and want everything they got, oh, he's got a better car in his garage, I want that car. Or oh, he's got a pool table in his living room, I want a pool table too. Paul said, huh, in every state I learned simply to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Who gets him through all these things? How has he learned to be so content? Not in himself, not in his own strength, but because he says, I can do all these things through Christ who strengthens me. I've learned how to get through hunger because of Jesus. He was hungry. I've learned how to do all things because of Christ. One final verse about that is Ephesians 6.10. Many of us have learned that. What does it say? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His strength. Because you will fail. Your strength will fail. You get sick. You get diseased. We get things called cancer. And it lays us up something fierce. And even kills. But Paul says, hey, there's a better strength. There's a strength beyond that. It's the strength of the Lord. How do you get through temptation without actually sinning? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Think about that next time you're tempted. I can't get through this, Lord. I am weak. And if left to myself, I would jump off that pinnacle to show myself something famous. I would turn stones into bread because I'm hungry. I would fail at every turn if left to myself. But because of Christ and His strength alone, you can get through anything. Has He ever failed? Not yet. It's we who fail. We who fail to use Him. Those are some good verses. Let's. Where do we leave off? Luke 20. Verse 20. 21 verse 20. Luke 20. 20, 20, 21, 20, Luke 21, verse 20. Yep, that's right. Let's go to Luke 21. It's a good place to start. Luke chapter 21, verse 20. We're going to go down to verse 24. Jesus says, But when you see Jerusalem... Wait, before I go on, did, did you get the point about persecution? Did I make that kind of clear? That, yeah, we're going to be persecuted. And don't be trying to develop a little speech, but when they call your name to testify, Jesus says, don't worry about it, what you're going to say. Because I'm going to speak through you. He's got you covered. He's, yeah. Well, yeah, he's got you plenty covered. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. I mean, Paul, Paul didn't have to think about anything when he spoke before Agrippa. He just started rattling off stuff. And in his heart. Yeah, exactly. And the Lord has brought it up. And you can only get out what you put in. So consume your word. Consume the stuff. Everybody should have a Bible. We live in America. But when you see Jerusalem, verse 20, surrounded by armies... Then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let those, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will, will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Kind of obscure verse, but we're going to get into it a little bit. So what was the Lord talking about? Again, this is pointing towards the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem when this happened. Incidentally, from what I understand, 1.1 million Jews were killed. When Rome came in. And it was such a horrible thing. The bodies were stacked up in Jerusalem because of the famine. The stenches were just horrible when they finally went in there. 97,000 were taken captive and led into all the countries all around. Incidentally, from what the records show, there were no Christians who died in that. Because they, they listened to the Lord and when they saw the armies coming to surround Jerusalem, they split! <laughs> Those who were in the field didn't come back in. They obeyed what Jesus said. 
According to the records, not one of these deaths or people let out were Christians. It behooves you to listen. You know, people go to these psychics and they're wrong all the time. Jesus has never been wrong. Why would he start now? So what does he say about our future? Well, for these people, don't. Don't, uh, don't go back in. When you see the armies in 70 AD, when you saw these people, the, the Romans coming around, the, the Christians split. They got out. They left. They listened to Jesus. You know, when those back in Exodus who covered their doors with the blood of the Lamb, they were protected from the, uh, the, the angel of death as well. <clears throat> June 1967. 1967, a year that will live in infamy. <laughs> Two months before I was born, Israel drove out the Jordanian armies and gained control of Jerusalem. Was that the fulfilling of this verse that says, and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled? Or not? Some say yes, that was it. When in 1967, in the Seven Day War, when, when the Israelis drove out the Jordanians, that was it. Jerusalem once again took control, or the Israel took control of Jerusalem, and we've been living in a borrowed time ever since. I don't know. Because there was a general who let the Muslims keep the Temple Mount and the mosque that was on there. They're not Jews. That would put them in the category of Gentiles. So has the time of the Gentiles ended in Jerusalem? I couldn't tell you for sure. You know, uh, there's some. I, I, I wish I knew, but there are some things that are still mysterious in the Bible, and I dare not claim to know everything. Yeah, but the problem, the problem is the Jews did not accept Christ. They were scattered. They right, were, exactly. When they accepted Christ, they were deported. Now they accepted Christ as the Savior. A lot of them are. Yeah, the church, uh, from what I understand, there's like at least 30,000 Christian Jews in Israel. Um, a large quantity. So you're right. And we pray for more. That the Lord has never stopped adding to the church daily those who be saved, as he said in the book of Acts. Um, what I pray for, what I have fun praying for, is praying for the Israeli Defense Force, the Israeli military. That the word of God would spread even more and more and more and more of the Israeli military would be saved because they don't stay in there forever. They have like a two-year rotation where I think for girls and I think guys stay in there for three years um, compulsory so that as they go in, they might go in unsaved, but when they come back out, they come out on Apostle Paul. Ready to hit the deck running. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Oh, well, yeah. North Korea, China. So, um, has that verse been fulfilled? Some would say yes, some would say no. I couldn't tell you for sure. Uh, I, if they are and we're living on borrowed time, um, then, then the, the urgency is even greater to be saved. On the other hand, if the times of the Gentiles has not been fulfilled, then surely it will be soon enough, so the urgency is still there, be saved. Because there's coming a time when there's coming a world leader who's going to make a deal for seven years and allow the Jews to build the temple back on that mount. So one way or the other, it's coming. Again, there's a 100% track record for the Bible. It's, it's going to be fulfilled. Yeah, from the north, verse 25. Is that where we left off? Yeah. Verse 25. That's why I'm going so fast. We, got, we had a lot of ground to cover today. Verse 25, And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity. We don't have that now, do we? The sea and the waves roaring. We don't have tsunamis and, and hurricanes coming in like in Louisiana, do we? No. <laughs> Men's hearts failing them from fear. Heart attacks happening younger and younger in men all the time. Which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. You know how when you're traveling, let's say 
you're going to California from here. You can say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? But let's say there's a, there's a Subway restaurant that makes your sandwich the greatest you've ever had it, and it's in El Paso. And you know that on the way to California, you first have to get through El Paso and have that wonderful Subway sandwich on the way, stop to look at gas, and whatnot. So you know people saying, hey, we're going to California, going to California. These things are going to happen. But before these things happen, you know you have to get through El Paso. What precedes this tribulation time? Jesus is saying, tribulation's coming, tribulation's coming. But we know one event precedes that. It's called the rapture. Because the Lord has, does not deal with both the church and Israel at the same time. He dealt with Israel. Then there was a line drawn in the sand at the cross. And he dealt with the church. And he's been dealing with the church ever since. And there's going to come another line in the sand. And the Lord once again will deal with Israel when the church is gone. Because he doesn't deal with both at the same time. It's always one or the other. Okay? Those last seven years, when you read about them in Revelation, when you study the book of Revelation, you really realize uh, the more deeper you go, it's written in a Hebraic style. It's written in Greek. But the style, it goes back to an Old Testament type of writing. In the structure with angels and prophets and plagues and destruction and all these kind of things happening that aren't happening right now so much in the age of grace. It's the church doing everything. The Lord's working through us. He trusts us to be his ambassador. What a trust. What a trust to say, you know what? I trust you and you and you and you to spread this gospel. My faith is in you. I put all my eggs in, in your basket. If you're not going to tell that person at dinner time, who is? If you're not going to tell your neighbor, who is? Who was it? One of the Charles um, Spurgeon said, How much must you hate a person to not warn them of the horrors of hell? For everybody we have failed to tell, how much hatred must we have towards those people to not warn them of the horrors of hell? And I might add to that, that shouldn't be what saves them. The grace of God and the wonders of heaven. That should be how much, how they get saved. By his mercy poured out for them by the cross. But anyway, uh, yeah, we're getting late. i got to press on. Oh, signs, signs, signs. What do we read about? Signs in the sun. Sign, have we had signs in the suns? 1859. Let's go backwards a little bit. 1859. There was a solar flare so strong, it disrupted, it destroyed basically the telegraph system in North America and in Europe. This solar flare sent, oh man, I wish I wasn't an electrician because I know all about this and how to explain it, but you wouldn't understand. <laughs> If you have a powerful magnet, okay, and another magnet on this side, a north and a south, they pull together, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you pull them apart and take a wire and spin it between those two magnets, the magnetic force between those two magnets will push the electrons in that wire around it, and that's called electricity. So at the Hoover Dam, you have these generators that have powerful magnets in them, and a lot of coils of wire spinning around these magnets, pushing the electrons through the wires into these lights and into our households. Okay? Well, that, that force of magnetism exploded on the sun in 1859, and it took 18 hours to leave the sun's surface and reach us. It was traveling over a million miles an hour, a solar flare. It, it's a, a coronal ejection is what it was called. Str going towards Earth, that magnetism, when that magnetism came down, it was like the wire moving in the, in the magnet, making electricity, right? Well, these telegraph wires are just sitting there, but the magnet was moving against it, and it sent the electricity so powerful, it burnt out, it shocked and burnt, it, it burned up paper, telegraph paper burned at the end of these telegraph machines. The, they disconnected the, the electrical sources, 
to these telegraphs, and they were still able to send messages. There was so much voltage left in these wires. It shocked the operators and is devastated what was then. If that happened today, if the same flare happened today, I could not describe the catastrophic event that would happen to the Earth. First, all the satellites would go out as this came down upon us. All the satellites would be fried. Because that magnetism would induce such a voltage in these fragile wires and components, the electronic components in the satellites, they would fry. All of our GPS and telecommunications that are controlled by the satellites, all of our spying on other nations, are they going to launch the bomb or not? Gone. Next to be hit with the airplanes, all of their electronics, gone. Airplanes would be dropping out of the sky. Then come down to our level. <clears throat> All the power distribution we have, all of our electrical grids, everything fried. Our cars fried. No gas, no water pumps for water in our houses. Gone! Imagine the devastation. And that's why it says here, and there will be signs in the sun. If one of these things happened today, and we missed it, I think in 2012, we missed it by nine days. A similar, on size and scope, Ejection passed by the earth nine days away from us. In 2012, we missed it by nine days. The same thing could have happened. Just fried everything. I think what would happen to the food that's under refrigeration right now? Gone. Supermarkets would be, would <laughs> be looted and emptied within minutes. <laughs> Gone. Well, Don't think... Yep, don't think you're going to hoard anything because out of desperation, people are going to come and find those stashes. Okay? Signs in the sun. That's just one thing. Perplexity of nations. We, we, we don't have perplexity of nations now, do we? Power conflicts, economic failures like Greece and Spain, growing fear of climate change. Greta will tell you all about yeah, that. Yeah, Greta, that girl who said, how dare you? Greta, please listen. Listen to this. In the 1700s, from 1700 to 1730, the Earth's temperature rose because of the sun's activity. Four degrees Celsius. In 30 years, in that short time frame, the Earth's temperature rose four degrees you know how much the Earth's... Now, now, in the 1700s, we didn't have... What was it called? The Industrial Revolution? With all the pollution and carbon we've been... Greta, listen. That we've been producing? In the last 100 years, how much has the Earth's temperature gone up? One degree. So you figure 30 degrees? Because of this... Or 30 year, 30 year period in the 1700s went up four degrees because of the sun's activity. But in the last 100 years, with all of our industrialness and pollution, it's only gone up one. I don't think man-made carbon dioxide is the issue here. When the sun could do it in minutes. You don't worry about man-made global climate change. Worry about God-made global climate change, because that is really coming. And I don't think Greta... You better not tell God, how dare you? <laughs> because God looks at the cross and says, how dare you? Angie's just doesn't like to, to be, be told or, or hinted at, uh, you're just merely a contributor. Right. Make your own choices. No, it's, <laughs> in fact, even the carbon dioxide, the, the, the amount is mm -hmm. that's producing this, it's, it's, it's basically, when you look at the true science, the undoctored science that these people have, the true science would tell you that our, what man has contributed to global climate change is negligible. Basically of none effect. The earth is just big and God's got his hand on it. You know, you, you can't pull the wool over his eyes and think, hey, we have the power. What audacity does man have to say, I can control the weather with my automobile? What audacity. <laughs> Global climate change. You know, God could do... Has God ever done... 
done that before? Think about the Genesis chapters 5 and 6 called the flood. Yes, God has the power and controls global climate change on a radical, massive level that we cannot even have the audacity to think about. So climate change. So as you see, the signs of the tribulation are growing closer and closer. Uh, what do you do? What, do we, what are we as Christians to do? What did the Lord say in that last verse we read in chapter 21, verse 28? Now when these things begin to happen, look up. Lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. El Paso is getting closer, baby. The rapture is getting closer. Look up. Your redemption draws nigh. Yeah. Let's go to verses 29 through 33. And I, I'll, I'll try and... Oh, Lord. Got so much. <laughs> Verse 29. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are all already budding and you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all of these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Isaiah 40, and incidentally, that's, he was talking about the destruction of Rome that happened. That generation did not pass away. It's 38 years. You know, he, the phrases he's using are extremely akin to Israel's wandering through the desert. They wandered for 38 years through the desert. That generation passed away. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Psalm 119, verse 89. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to belabor this point because the Word of God is not... It's just taken so for granted these days. People just don't even listen to it anymore. 119, or preach from it. Chapter 119, verse 89. This is in the section called Lamed. The Lord says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. In other words, we might try and change it. We might try and change the pronouns. We might try and change genders in the word of God. The word of God says, uh, No, because it's forever settled in heaven. Forever. And you know forever means forever. Matthew 5, 8. What does Jesus have to say about this? I think he's got a little... Well, we've already read some of it, but we'll read another verse. Matthew 5, 8, Sermon on the Mount. Not 8. Oh, I should have researched this better. Was it 18? I know it's in Matthew. 18. I forgot the one. It's Matthew 5, 18. says... For assuredly I say to you, till, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by any means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. In other words, Jesus says, I have a perfect track record. Nothing's going to spoil it until it's all done. And those were the smallest. What they did was put little marks under the, the letters in Hebrew uh, to make vowel pointings to tell what the vowel was because when you read Hebrew it's only consonants so to get the proper pronunciation they put little dots underneath to make a vowel sound um, and the other one uh, those are the titles underneath but the Yod not one Yod or title Yod was the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet it's just a little ch -ch -ch Yod is also the first letter in the unpronounceable name of God. Yud, He, Vav, He is the actual four letters that spell the name of God. But they just don't have those pointings underneath because they don't know how exactly how it's pronounced now. We don't know the proper pronunciation. Um, but, it, you know, there's some would say Jehovah is the pronunciation. Some would say Yahweh. Um, there's no conclusive evidence pointing to either one, 
Um, and so I made it my own. Um, I took the vowels from the word love, which uses the same sounds, ahava, and put them underneath, because God is love, the yud heh vav heh, same, nearly identical four letters, same sounds, but they use different letters, and come up with yahava, because God is love. I couldn't imagine a better marriage. We read Matthew 5, 18. <laughs> How about Matthew 24, 35? Um, I know I'm belaboring this, but it needs to be belabored because the Word of God is worth it. 2435, Matthew 2435. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means pass away, says Jesus. Um, and I'm going to stop there. i got one more if you want to look it up. 1 Peter 125. Um, that generation saw Rome's destruction. Verses 34 to the end. No, 34, 36. Luke 21, verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come, on, it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always. Why? Lest you take your Christianity for granted. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's just a little warning, Jesus says. Be careful about your Christianity. Um, quickly now, Revelation 3, 1 through 3. Revelation 3, 1 through 3 says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write these things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive. Jesus says, But you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I'll come upon you. To me, this is saying that this church that has a name of being alive and is really dead, an exciting, active, alive church, but really spiritually is dead, that the Lord says, unless you wake up, you're at risk of missing the rapture. Because my time will then sneak upon you, but it, if you're ready, it won't sneak upon you. But if you're not ready, the Lord says, hey, it's going to sneak upon you and you're going to miss it. How many times do people actually catch a thief versus the thief not being caught? Most thieves do their craft so well, they get in and out and aren't, aren't even caught. Or else it wouldn't be a practice. <laughs> Quite frankly. Seed type 3 was this kind of church. If you read about it in Matthew 13. Remember the four seeds that fell on the ground? Matthew 13. Jesus was telling that parable. Matthew 13, 32 says this. About the third type of seed that fell on the ground. Which indeed is the least of... Oh, another bad one? Please. Yes, it is. I'm so sorry. Let's see which one it really is. <laughs> the parable explained. It should have been. Same chapter, Matthew 13. I think... Verse 22. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word of God and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Remember what he said to the church in Revelation? You look alive, but you're really dead. 
Why? Because of the deceitfulness of riches. Riches are deceitful. They cause you to do, the, the temptation to be rich causes people to do stupid things. How many people fall for the get rich quick scheme? Even offered on television. If you please just send me a thousand dollars to the address at the bottom of your screen. The Lord will bless you ten times. You'll see. The deceitfulness of riches. Hebrews 9, 28. Speaking of the rapture and missing the rapture. Who is the Lord coming back for? Yeah, remember those in Revelation they weren't ready? The dead church wasn't watching? Remember his word that we just read in Luke? Watch. <clears throat> Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. This coming again a second time is not referring to at the end of the tribulation. This is referring to how when he ascended and the angels said, don't you know he's coming back in the same way in the clouds? That's the reference he's referring to. He's coming back again for those who are waiting because there are some who have departed from the faith who say, where is the coming of the Lord? They're not watching. This is in reference to that. It was in actually the first chapter of Acts 9 and 11, how he's returning in the clouds. There are other scriptures. Again, we can't get into them. I'm sorry. Verses 37 and 38. Let's finish the chapter. Luke 21, 37 and 38. The last two verses. And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and stayed on the mount, mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. So probably these were times when he went out back out to the Mount of Olives to pray and, and just get recharged and also to minister to the disciples. He had his little talks with them, explaining things and expounding on these parables and talks he was having. Remember, he told the parable and the disciples would say, what does that mean? This is probably their teaching time. When he finished in the, in the temple, he went out to the Mount of Olives. Crowds, goodness gracious, as he taught in the temple, they went to hear him early in the morning. The people came to him to hear him in the temple. We're talking massive crowds. Remember, this is Passover week. People from all over the world, all the good Jewish people who wanted to honor the law, came from all around. The city swelled probably to ten times its normal, like from 300,000 people to 3 million people in that week because people from all around the world came to offer Passover. So he had an audience in that temple. As he drove out the money changers, people were just coming from all around to hear what he had to say. Large crowds. And I can only imagine that Passover was a Passover they would never forget. Remember the Passover 10 years ago when that guy Jesus was there teaching in the temple? Oh yeah, how he threw out the money changers and everything. That was wild. All those things he taught. Yeah, pretty weird stuff. Remember 20 years ago when Jesus was in the temple, taught that Passover? Remember 30 years ago when Jesus was in the temple, in the temple and he taught that Passover? Remember 38 years ago when he taught and he said something about these armies that are gathered around us we didn't listen and now we're caught in the city because we didn't listen to that Passover 38 years ago that they would never forget when Jesus said when you see these things begin to happen get out if you're in the fields don't thug, come back in don't you know Jesus is saying the same thing today when you look around and see the perplexity of nations and see the signs in the sun. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. It's coming. It's happening. If you've not accepted Jesus into your heart, don't delay. Today is the day of salvation. Just finally yield. So you're right, Lord. Everything you said is true and it's all coming to pass. And I want to be found with my name written in heaven. And I want to hear you say, well done, good, faithful servant, instead of, depart from me, you work of iniquity. Just cry out to him. There's no special prayer that you have to pray. <clears throat> no, people like to call a sinner's prayer. That's nothing wrong with that either. Any way you want to call out to the Lord and just say, Lord, help, that cry of faith is enough. Look what it did to the thief on the cross. Lord, help. He was saved. He wasn't baptized. There wasn't any magical prayer. 
so Lord help. I encourage you, if you have not done that yet, do that today. Cry out to the Lord. And when you do, He will fill you up with His Holy Spirit and you will never be the same. And you will never regret it. Thank you and join us next week for chapter 22. Bye.